insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 45, The Faith is Strong in This One. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my beautiful and brilliant co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are we doing today, sweetie? I'm tired. How are you? (laughs) Yeah, I'm kind of getting there, too. It's been 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 a very long week. Long week, and it's only Thursday. It is Thursday, right? All day, yeah. Yeah. Uh, So, kind of a... Short show today, but mm-hmm. themed, I guess, again. Right. We seem to be getting into these quite often. We're good um, like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so in our Disney detective, we have a cute little story uh, from The Mandalorian. Uh, then we have some additional Mandalorian information about some merchandising news uh, coming out of the show. And the exciting news of the rise of the resistance being uh, opened up in Florida at uh, Galaxy's Edge. And then in our entertainment news, uh, we have uh, Tiffany, is it Haddish? Or Haddish. Haddish. Mm-hmm. Um, with uh, some faith stories there. And then uh, we will grudgingly talk about... <laughs> um, Just... Yeah. <laughs> the Irishman. And then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. Uh, ready to get started? Sure. All right. Let's get into it. Go for Disney Detective. So in our first cute little uh, Disney story, um, there were a couple of different articles that came out Um from uh, with um, Bryce Dallas Howard, who directed the latest episode of The Mandalorian, and basically how she got to keep the secret of Baby Yoda with her kids because her kids had actually come to the set, had watched filming, oh, wow. and okay. you know, and her kids were uh, six and eleven at the time because it was almost a year ago that they actually filmed, you know. That, that episode. Right. So she said, the thing that I was most nervous about was that my kids had been on the set quite a bit and they had seen Baby um, and interacted with Baby. So she told the Hollywood Reporter, when we were filming, my kids were 6 and 11. Now they're 7 and 12. And when the kids went back to school every day, I would say, so what are we not going to talk about today? And they would say, <laughs> Baby. Um, but then now it's very confusing because she's like, well, now you can talk about Baby. And they're like, oh, okay. Okay. But for like a year, it was, but you mom, know, everybody knows about it now. Right. You know, but for a year, they had to keep their their mouth shut. Oh, so it was funny. it was kind of kind of cute, um, you know, and of course, now, you know, everybody's like, I want, you know, the merchandise. And that's, you know, kind of leading to our, our next story. But, you know, she she kind of says that, you know, yeah, everybody's kind of pissed off that, you know, there's no merchandise available. But, you know, she kind of tends to agree that. The decision not to come out with stuff before the show even, you know, aired was kind of a a good idea, you know, to keep the suspense, you know, behind it. Um, She also talked about, you know, some of the scenes that she um, shot for um, this episode were a little bit of an homage to to other things. Um, She said there was one scene... um, that was done, which was homage to a scene that she had done when she was an actress um, and acted with Joaquin Phoenix in The Village. And then, of course, all the ATST scenes were like a Jurassic Park 
uh, reference to things, you know, like that. Um, you know, and then of course, you know, the, the big talk was about, you know, baby sipping soup. Right. Um, and it was, you know, here you have, you know, Gina and, and Mando are, you know, destroying each other. And then all of a sudden, you know, you, you see, you know, the scene turns and it's, you know, baby quote unquote Kevin or Yoda, uh, right, on, right. you know, sitting there just, you know, sipping soup and that like totally s- stole the, the scene away, you know, from everything. So you have this, you know, martial arts, you know, kick, kicking and dragging, you know, scene going on and then, you know, sipping yeah. the soup. Um, and she said that they actually, you know, did many takes with that. It was, you know, does he do it with one hand, two hands, sip a lot, sip a little, baby sip, a hearty sip. So they actually filmed, you know, multiple versions, oh, you know, of it to, to get just that, that right one. Um, so obviously, you know, again, Baby Yoda is just, you know, taking the world <laughs> by by storm. Um, so in our second story, talking about the merchandise, you know, obviously, you know, everywhere you go is Baby Yoda, Baby Yoda. Um, now you're actually starting to see um, different websites where you can pre-order the merchandise. Uh, Walmart was one of them, uh, that started, um, now DisneyStore.com actually has them listed on their website. The only thing is if you were looking to get them for Christmas, it isn't going to happen. Some of the items, um, have a 4-1 ship date. Um, now, is that from Disney or is that from Walmart? Because I know Walmart was... This was Disney doc, DisneyStore.com. Okay. I actually looked and there were... Um, so, the one bobblehead was like a 6.30 date. Wow. And then there was another item. I think the Funko Pop was a 4.1 estimated wow. date. So that was through Disney. Now, I didn't go looking at other websites because you know some of them have a doll some of them have um the funko pop so you know it'll be interesting to see who gets the stuff you know first the other thing that you know disney had um on their site where they had t-shirts and those were pretty much available within a couple of weeks because they print on demand right, you know for right. those so it's nothing that they have to you know really make like a, a dollar a Funko Pop so it'll be interesting because I know uh, Hot Topic is supposed to be carrying stuff um, Box Lunch is supposed to be getting stuff I think Target's supposed to be doing you know basically all all your you know normal retailers um, right. of pop culture stuff you know will eventually get it just you know when, um, you know, when it'll actually happen. And obviously, you know, we were looking just the other day, you know, Etsy is your, yeah, your friend. It's, it's all over um, Etsy. You know, Etsy is all over the place. Some of the stuff looks really cool. Some of it looks kind of creepy. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it all depends on, you know, how desperate you are. And, and like we were even talking, um, you know, the other day, if it's going to be six months until, you know, four to, to six months before something comes out, is there still going to be demand for it, you know? Mm-hmm. And, you know, is it worthwhile to pre-order something when you're still waiting so many months out? Or is it, you know, once it comes out, is the market just going to be flooded and, you know, you'll be able to get it? Yeah. You know, so... Well, it, it boggles the mind that Disney kind of missed the boat on this one again, like they did with Frozen when right. it first came yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. You know, I can totally understand the, the idea of keeping the secrecy around it, but... Right. You're, you're, you're missing an entire Christmas, Christmas season. season for this. Yeah, yeah. So... Well... We'll see. I blame Bob Iger. It's all his fault. <laughs> it's, it's Bob's fault. <sighs> uh, so what's our uh, Rise of the Resistance story? So Rise of the Resistance, the new ride in Star Wars Galaxy's Edge at Hollywood Studios actually opened today. Um, what was really funny, there were a whole bunch of different memes going uh, around about... Um, <laughs> People checking uh, their their Disney their Disney app to see what the wait time was, um, and at lunchtime when I checked, it wasn't even showing up on oh, wow. the app. So 
either the wait was just so incredibly long <laughs> or they just didn't, you know, update. I don't know. Maybe I needed to update the app. But um, Smuggler's Run actually had a 55 minute wait, which really isn't bad a- a- at all. Yeah. Um, and Slinky Dog had like a 90 minute wait. So I was like, well, maybe. So this is going to be fun when we're down there. Yeah. So. So, so we do have a, a clip here. Let's. Uh, sure. Let's, let's play take the a clip. look at the clip. ride elements and ride um, types into this one experience. So so it's never really been done before. We're really breaking new ground with this combination of different attraction types to pull it to life and make sure that we're giving guests something that they've never even seen before. Tell them it's a prisoner transfer. Did it work? Good. Now get him on. How many in your crew? Our officers are real cast members. We're usually trained to be very welcoming, but as our first order cast members, we need to, to make sure that everyone's staying in line. And so it's a really fun kind of role that our cast members get to play. We have 50 stormtroopers, all audio animatronic characters, no live actors in that hangar base. Uh, there is a variety, some of which are static and some of which have just slight articulations just to kind of give that idea of a full rank of actual humans in front of you. Very cool. Yeah. Very it, cool. It, so I did read an article today on this um, really where they talked about um, really cool thing is trying to figure out how to stop this video here. <laughs> Hang on. Stop. There we go. There, no, no. Nope. See, now start up again. We don't want to do that. <sighs> you know. Because when <laughs> I hate when they hijack me like this. Yeah. All right. So that one goes away. Okay. And then, and then, then that one. Here. And then this one has to go away. There, there we, we go. go. All we right. Good All job. Right. All right. First day with the new computer. <sighs> I knew I should have grabbed the, uh, I should have just grabbed that video. And, nah, that's all right. It. Anyway. So you were saying you read an article. So I read an article today and, and it was uh, uh, a media walkthrough of the site. Okay. Of the, of the ride. Mm-hmm. And there's three scenes. Right. It's, it's, it's done 18 in. 18 minutes mm-hmm. long, yep. which is astonishing, which tells me you're going to have a ridiculous wait time for this. Mm. Well, and I think because of it being broken up into the the three acts, it'll kind of help, you know, and, and probably part of it, you know, a good portion of that's, you know, like pre-show number one, pre-show, you know. So I think it, it'll help to kind of move things along because as you're leaving the one scene to go to the next scene, then they can load the next group of people, you know, right. and kind of keep it flowing almost to the the type of you know like a haunted mansion ride that's a continuous moving thing sure, where sure. you know they they've had certain well, rides the, the where they couldn't that do that i saw it was very similar to the star trek the experience mm. ride that we went on when we were out in vegas right right um where it's it's transitions you're taking right. groups in through transitions mm-hmm. and there was even one like you know the one thing that really still stands out to me to this day Mm -hmm. was the transporter sequence yeah where how you're just standing in a regular room you're in a room you the lights go out the transporter sound happens and then you're in another room and the floor is different right Mm -hmm. which i still don't know how they did that right they have a similar effect with Mm -hmm. this apparently yeah i i just seeing bits and pieces um you know and then there was a video that came out because i guess you know when they had the um the media uh, people there, they also had a bunch of um, celebrities there as well, and it was their reactions to it. And, you know, all of them were saying, oh, my God, this is like nothing I've ever been on, totally immersive yeah. and just totally incredible how, you know, the technology and, and everything else, you know, behind it. So it it 
I'm excited. Yeah, and again, it definitely looks God cool. only knows what, you know, because we're going to be there on Christmas Eve. Um, you know, one of the the busiest weeks of, of so Disney. So basically we need to show up at 8 o'clock in the morning, get rope drop, <laughs> and get in line. I think before 8 o'clock in the morning, we, we need to check out of the hotel, go and, you know, just stand there and, and basically run uh, to galaxy's edge to to get online for it yeah. but it you know i haven't heard anything bad uh, you know about it um you know everything everybody was just excited you know because even with smugglers run uh, you know people were saying well unless you're a pilot you know you're just right. basically pushing one button you know you're right, not really right. it's still cool but you're not you know as part of it where this just seems like you know, everywhere you look, you know, you're, you feel like you're in the movie. Yeah. And that, you know? that's what this article talked about yeah. is that you're, you're literally part of the plot line. Yeah. So obviously cool. fingers crossed, we, you know, we get on it, um, you know, when we're down there, you know, in a couple of weeks and we'll definitely have a, a, a firsthand account, you know, review of it, but yep. I'm, I'm excited now. So should be cool. Very cool. So that was all we had in our Disney detective mm -hmm. segment. Yep. Uh, and we'll come back with our entertainment news. Tell us about a bat mitzvah. <laughs> so this was actually kind of cool. Um, Tiffany Haddish uh, is a, a comedian. Um, she's been in a, a bunch of different movies. Um, you know, there's been a bunch of different uh, TV shows that, you know, she's been on, um, and she's hosted Saturday Night Live, uh, Saturday Night Live and, and whatnot. Um, and she's actually come out where she's now, um, you know, making it known that she identifies with her Jewish identity, which she didn't actually find out about until she was about 27. Um, and she just turned 40. Uh, so she decided to hold a black mitzvah. Um, and she actually also has a um, comedy special of the same title uh, that dropped on uh, Netflix. I believe it actually came out today. Uh, or no, a couple days ago. It was December 3rd, um, which was also the day of her, her 40th party. Um, she said her, her father, I guess, had, you know, done some research and found out, you know, that they were Jewish. And she's actually... Um, you know, started studying Torah and, and learning how to read Hebrew and, and really, you know, embracing it. Nice. Um, and she said she even did, you know, a 23 and me, uh, you know, genetic testing. <laughs> and sure enough, it, it came back, you know, that she was like, all right, I guess this is, you know, really true and, and whatnot. So, you know, kind of kind of cool, you know. So did, did, did it say what prompted the, the research on the part of her father? Uh, no, it just said that, uh, you know, that uh, she, oh, she didn't meet her father, I'm sorry, until she was 27, and then he told her, you know, that um, that he was Jewish, and, you know, that she was, oh, and she was so like, that what? she's known for some time now. Right, well, she yeah, she okay. found out when she was 27, she's 40 now. Oh, so it's okay, been, okay, okay. Right, so, you know, she didn't find out about her Jewish history until she was, you know, an adult and figured, hey, you know what? It's time to have a bat mitzvah. And Interesting. why have a bat mitzvah? You know, I'll have a black mitzvah. So Not looking sure forward to, <laughs> well, because she happens to be black. Well, so. <laughs> I, I understand, but like, I don't. I don't know. I, I guess you have entail? to. I don't know. I guess I'll, you, you know, have I'll have to watch the special, watch the special to, <laughs> to see, you know, what, uh, um, what do you call it? You know. Nice. What what it's all about. So, okay, fair enough. So let's. <laughs> I've been trying to avoid talking about this. I even asked you before the, the show. Do we have, do we to, have talk to talk about, about, this? about it. But well, this was funny because I'll let you talk about it. So we have um, uh, a I, disdain for. Well, no, we have a disdain for that. Well, I want to say Amazon echoes echoes right because yeah. that's what okay. So we have a whole bunch of Amazon echoes throughout our house, and and some of them are the the um, Amazon show, so it's a little screen or whatever. So this actually popped up yesterday. 
<laughs> and we kind of we started like bantering about it. And then as it turned out, I found the news article about it. So of course I had to throw it in just because I wanted to, you know, get your Annoy reaction. Me. Yeah, that was and it was the National Board of Review names the Irishman the year's best film. Right. So I, I kind of laughed because I had never heard of is this, like, this group is this before. Like, so is this kind of like being like the the best burger town and <laughs> burger joint in town because you paid the newspaper enough to get right, in there. So this is you know so so the National Board of Review has named Martin Scorsese's film The Irishman the best film of 2019, um, and the, uh, the two of the stars Robert De Niro and Al Pacino are also receiving the organization's inaugural inaugural icon award so of course when i read that i'm thinking oh this organization has only been around like you know for like since the movie came out <laughs> since the movie came out when really it was actually established in 1909 by theater owners protesting the new york uh mayor's attempt to block the exhibition of motion pictures in the city um and it's been picking best films since 1930 so this is actually an organization that's do we been do we around. know what some of their best films are that they picked by chance <laughs> well it's funny because in the one thing over the last 10 years a little over half of the films on their list have actually ended up being best picture nominations but only one um, winner in the last 18 years, um, which was 2014's A Most Violent Year, failed to land an Oscar nomination mm. for Best Picture. So they actually, you know, have a pretty decent track record. But again, I was kind of like, oh, really? Um, but they listed, you know, they, they, they talked about, you know, they, they had a whole list. So it wasn't just, you know, they give like a top 10 list of movies. So it was um, 1917, Dolomite is my name, Ford versus Ferrari, Jojo Rabbit, Knives Out, Marriage Story, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, uh, Richard Jewell, Uncut Gems, and Wave. So they do, you know, so they, they pick the best overall, but then they give like their top 10 list. Um, then Quentin Tarantino uh, was named this year's best director for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Um, you know, acting awards went to Adam Sandler for Uncut Gems and Renee Zellweger for Judy. Um, Brad Pitt for Once in Time in America, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Kathy Bates for Richard Jewell. Um, you know, so they, they give a, a bunch of, you know, awards out, but of course it was just hysterical because <laughs> of the fact, you know, that your favorite film, you know, and, and what was funny was, what was it? I guess it was last night because we were watching uh, the Crown, right? And the movie was over, and we were kind of scrolling through, like, oh, okay, what's going to be our next thing to watch? Because we're, you know, we only have one more episode left, and we actually watched the trailer for <laughs> The Irishman, and it was just, and it was just like, oh, look, it's a mafia movie. Oh boy, another mafia movie! Wow, wow, and it has Robert De Niro, Joe Pesci, like. Al Pacino. Al Pacino. Like, right. <laughs> there was nothing. Yeah. It's so, the same mafia movie over and over again. Yeah. So, you know, we have no desire to watch it. Hey, it might be a really good movie, but, you if know. If you like mafia movies. Supposedly it's really good. Then you probably watch Martin Scorsese films because <laughs> apparently that's really all he makes. Right. Right. So that that it was really more just to, you know. Thanks. I appreciate it. poke the cage because, you know. Cage poke. <laughs> We'll be back with our insightful picks of the week, which better not be the Irish. <gasps> Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick is not the Irish. I was, I was, was going to do it, but then I was like, no, I won't. Uh, this was actually a... Uh, sh uh, series that popped up on Netflix. Again, it was one of those, hey, since you've watched this, you might want to watch this. Um, and it is called The Movies That Made Us. Uh, so the gist of it is it's along the same lines and it's actually by the same uh, people that made uh, The Toys That Made Us, that documentary. Um, so 
basically it's the story behind various blockbuster movies from the 80s and 90s. So the first set of episodes um, of the movies that made us takes a deep dive into four movies. Home Alone, Dirty Dancing, Die Hard, and Ghostbusters. Um, the first episode that I watched, I've only watched one so far, was Dirty Dancing. Um, and it was really kind of interesting because there were things about the movie that, you know, I didn't know. Um, they interview a couple of the stars. Obviously, Patrick Swayze isn't alive anymore, but they do interview his wife uh, for a bunch of different things. Um, you know, not the, the main stars of the movie, but they do, you know, have a couple of stars that... Um, that they they interview they have you know the different producer and they have the writer and and what was interesting is how the story you know came to be and you know the different locations and they had you know the choreographer and the music director um and that you know the the um the production company you know they they took this story around to all the different um studios and none of the major studios wanted it and they even took it to you know the lower studios none of them wanted it the studio that actually ended up distributing it was actually a company that started out just doing direct to video uh oh, movies funny. and this was actually their first big movie that they they ever did um so it was kind of you know interesting how you know they were going back and forth the one person that viewed the movie was like nope can it throw it out and then they did a test screening for like a thousand people and everybody loved it and then they were like no nope, we need to go forward mm. with it um and and it was just an interesting you know story and if you've ever watched the toys that make us, you know, they're little quirky yeah, things yeah, they that do they a do. Good job with storytelling. Yeah, and that's exactly what they do with this, with the quirky little animation and and this and that. But you know, it, it was really good. So I'm I'm definitely looking forward to, oh, cool. um, I'll have to watch it. seeing the the other ones. Um, what was kind of cool was at one point because when they did the filming. It's supposed to take place in the Catskills. They couldn't, you know, the the amount of money it would have cost for them to do it because they could. They only had like a fourteen day uh, shooting schedule. They ended up doing it in, um, I want to say, I can't remember. They ended up doing it in the South, and they did it obviously after the season was over. But they needed to do it quickly before you know the leaves were changing color. So it was actually two different locations. So like the main building was one, but all the the um, the bungalows you know were a separate one. And at the end, you know the woman that was the producer, they actually took her back to it. And what's neat is at the location they actually have signs up. Of you know oh this is where this part was oh, shot so nice, they still do nice. like a dirty dancing yeah, like tour, weekend tour, yeah. you know where you can go and they reenact you know certain things so that was kind of cool to see and from what I read about some of the other episodes some of the people that they interview they actually go back to some of the locations nice. where things were shot to have them you know reminisce so that'll be kind of cool to, to see cool. so nice good pick thank you So my pick this week, I'm going to go uh, cranky old man pick here. <laughs> Good uh, to know. Because I feel like my father with this one. And <laughs> it's the greatest events of World War II in color. Uh, this is on Netflix. It's a 10-part series. Um, greatest events of World War II in color is a comprehensive and uh, it is comprehensive and sweeping in scope. A definitive treatment of a conflict that revolutionized modern warfare. The expertly restored and colorized footage is graphic, taking a viewer from the plains of Europe to the jungles of Southeast Asia. Commentary is supplied by British, German, and American historians. Uh, British actor Der uh, Derek uh, Jacoby provides the narration. Uh, the war's major turning points are all covered. Uh, the ninth episode uh, uh, features the liberation of uh, Buchenwald, uh, which deals exclusively with the events leading up to and including the Holocaust. The first episodes uh, lay the groundwork for Germany's aggressive plan to overturn the 1919 Treaty of Versailles 
and expand its borders at the expense of its neighbors. Greatest Events of World War II in Color graphically recreates this titanic struggle. Um, and it's interesting to watch a film like this because it's a contemporary uh, series of episodes that they do with fairly well-known, and I say well-known historians. I mean, not, not a lot of people, not a lot of historians. <laughs> you, know, you would know them because you, well watch, <laughs> you watch a lot of documentaries. Um, but yeah, there, there are a lot of historians that pop up in a lot of the modern documentaries that are on TV now. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're not getting firsthand accounts in a lot of cases by these historians because they're relatively young historians. But it is an interesting take on um, modern society and values and uh, understanding of what happened during the war. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's interspersed with what typically people remember as being a black and white war. Mm, yeah. Um, so it's interesting to see in color. Now, granted, these colors are interpreted right um, based on historical accounts. Mm-hmm. They go back and they restore the footage and they colorize it and so forth. Um, there's some inaccuracies because there just happens to be some inaccuracies, but there mm-hmm. isn't everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, but all in all, I think it's a it's the. The footage itself is very dramatic. There's a lot of footage in here that isn't commonly aired. And they talk in the promo about the ninth episode uh, with the concentration camps. Mm -hmm. And seeing that footage that has always been portrayed as black and white, um, seeing that portrayed in color gives it a whole new depth. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and a whole new characteristic to it. Um, so it was very impactful watching it. Um, it was, it was educational. There was a lot that I learned, uh, but it was, it was, I don't want to say it was entertaining watching war, but, um, it's portrayed in such a way that it, it it makes it digestible. Mm -hmm. It's, it's easy to digest. Um, so Greatest Events of World War II in Color is streaming now on Netflix, and it's a 10-part series. Very cool. And uh, I think that was all we had. Mm-hmm. I uh, did want to offer one programming note. We will be on hiatus during the holidays. Uh, we'll be skipping two weeks. Um, well, I think next week we're going to probably do the weekend. Right. Next week we'll be... Filming live on the weekend. Right. The week after, we're not sure. The week after, we're probably not because right. the schedule's too tight. And then the week after that, we're not going to be around. And I'm not taking the studio with us on the road. Right. We were originally going to try and do stuff from, you know, the road. But I right. think we decided to actually take a little vacation. We, we deserve the time off. Yeah. This is, you know, 45. We'll get 46 episodes under our belt before we take a break. So right, right. Not so bad. I think, think we've done pretty well. Next week, we will kind of have a, a holiday theme to mm-hmm. it, though. We do yep. a little uh, treat, treat, a little special uh, project that we've just finalized that we'll mm-hmm. have next week. Uh, but until then, you can get a hold of us via email at comments at insightsintothings.com. On Twitter at insights underscore things. You can get our video uh, podcast on YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. Obviously, our website, www.insightsintothings.com. And the audio versions with transcripts and show notes is available at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. And on Facebook at facebook.com backslash insights into things podcast. Another one in the books. Yep. Have a good one, everyone. Bye.